Hi, everyone. Welcome and good evening, and thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Claire, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I am so pleased to introduce this virtual event with Sadiq Bafana, who is here with his debut, Stories from the Tenants Downstairs. He'll be in conversation with Marcus Burke. Through virtual events like this evening's, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to our community and our ever-growing digital community. Thank you for joining us tonight in support of our authors and the incredible staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstore. We sincerely appreciate your support now and always. Summer might be winding down, but we are getting excited to really ramp things up again in September with a slew of events, many of them in person. Our calendar appears on our website at harvard.com slash events, where you can also sign up for our email newsletter and even browse our shelves from home. After this introduction, I will drop a link in the chat to order stories from the tenants downstairs. Your purchases support the future of the bookstore and make this author series possible. Um, thank you. Uh, the, the evening's event does include time for your questions. Um, if you have a question for our speakers at any time during the talk tonight, you can go to the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. Uh, the event also has closed captioning available. Uh, and depending on the version of Zoom you're using, you may need to enable the captions yourself by clicking on the closed caption live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. And finally, as you might have experienced in virtual gatherings over the past three years at this point, um, technical issues might arise. If they do, we'll do our best to resolve them quickly, and we thank you for your patience and understanding. Sadiq Bafana is a graduate of NYU's MFA program and a public school teacher in Brooklyn. You may be familiar with his work that has appeared in the Sewanee Review and Granta, and he was named a fellow at the Center for Fiction in 2018. He'll be in conversation this evening with Marcus Burke, who is the author of the critically acclaimed Team Seven. He's also been recognized by the University of Iowa MacArthur Foundation Fund, who awarded him a grant in honor of James Allen McPherson. Apartment buildings are a unique kind of community, people united by place rather than a family, profession, or shared interest. And yet it is a community. If you've ever lived in one, you've probably imagined what might be going on behind your neighbor's doors. In his bold and beguiling debut, Sadiq introduces us to the residents of one apartment building, story by story, creating their world and welcome, welcoming us into it. The book was only published yesterday, but the rave reviews have been pouring in. The New York Times says, the brilliance of this debut is that Pafana doesn't let anyone go unseen. Stories from the Tenants Downstairs takes place at Banneker Terrace, a fictional apartment in Harlem. Over the course of the eight stories in the collection, he renders the struggles and rich inner lives of the building's tenants after Banneker is sold to a corporate real estate company that is interested in hiking rents, evicting tenants, and ultimately turning a profit. He masterfully paints a portrait of the people most impacted by gentrification. And Claire Massoud writes, Few writers can inhabit multiple characters with equal intensity and vivacity, and most who can are, of course, playwrights or screenwriters. Sadiq Bafana's debut collection reveals him to have this rare gift. Uh, and so now I'm pleased to turn things over to tonight's speakers. Uh, Marcus and Sadiq, the virtual podium is yours. Thanks so much for that introduction. Um, we in the hometown virtually, you know, I'm in the mass, um, Boston's my hometown. Marcus, it's, it's a pleasure to be, be, be with you. Yeah, thanks talk. for inviting me, man. Yeah, yeah man. Um, cool. I guess I'll, I'll, I'll just read, uh, just the passage, um, to kick this off. I'm in my son's room. He's got a, it's a bed tent. This is a, <laughs> so he's a, he just loves to go in the bed tent. Um, so I'm behind the bed tent. Um, <clears throat> this is from a story called Camaraderie. Um, it's about uh, a guy named Derry. And in this section, he's discussing his dreams, frustrations, um, and he's contemplating doing something that he doesn't want to do um so just read a tiny part of it so uh because then auntie and uncle would be right 
about all we do is run around giving each other sex. They think you gay because something happened. Even though I knew since the very first time I was at the public pool and I seen the lifeguard's penis come out of shorts like a beaver. When my uncle found out about me, all he could say to me was, you know, sex is only for procreation. Meanwhile, God told Noah two of every animal, but he ain't say a boy and a girl. That's why I be careful of what I do. I do what I do behind closed doors. I don't be publicizing or bragging. When I'm around straight men, I make them feel comfortable. Even if I gotta change how I talk, that make it easier for all of us. That's why I told Quad no. My auntie said, you can sell whatever you want, but it's over when you start selling you. But I was having a hard time finding work. Mimi who lived two floors up, she used to let me come over and help her out with her customers. When it come to hair, everybody know this her building. I was shampooing her client's hair, draping them. She was paying me $20 a session. Between that and what my auntie left me, I was doing all right. Then one day she gonna turn around and say, I don't need you no more. That same day, the covers to one of the outlets in my place came off. All you seen was sparks. Then my heat got turned off. Then trash started coming out my shower. Before you knew it, what my auntie left me ran out. My credit cards was maxed out. I couldn't sleep. I'd be at the library working on my resume and the collectors would have no sympathy. They just blow up my phone. This is your third notice. I wanted to be like, bitch, I know I noticed everything. I just don't have the money. I applied for several hairstylist positions. They didn't want me. I applied to Essence, got the dial tone, and I still had to get my rent money. I still had just 60 days. Then I started thinking, is it really an issue if you talking to them first? Isn't that like a regular date? Couldn't you have it in your mind to do it for free? If they gave you money, wouldn't that be on them? Isn't making a connection different from getting naked? I also thought, how different would it be to practice servicing these clients? Maybe it would help my business. Ever since I was born, I knew I was gonna be great. I have the whole package, a caring personality, talent, photo friendly. I have many avenues. Before hair, I could have done makeup. When we was at Sephora, me and Teddy Lou used to pull customers to the side for consultation until the Hayden ass manager put a stop to it. I always have ideas in my head. You know how many people out there not working for a dream? They sweeping, carrying boxes, not me. You gotta be ready for your big break. You gotta grow. You gotta block out all the chirping. The more I thought about it, the more I said, maybe Kwa was right. Maybe I should be more concerned about my brand. I'll stop right there. So, yeah. Can I ask you a question about that story? Yeah, yeah, yes. Go ahead. <laughs> you know, because uh, I feel like, you know, when you're writing the neighborhood, right, you know, like mm -hmm. you kind of have to talk about everybody. You know, you yeah. can't just talk about, the cast behind the dumpster, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. And uh, you know, and I'm working on a book now, and I have a character that's gay in my book also. Mm -hmm. Now, how did you, uh, like, how did you navigate writing the story from that point of view, if that's outside of your lived experience? Mm, great question. Um, and I, I, I chose to read that passage for one reason tonight, and that's because it's the the story that scares me the most, honestly, because, um, you know, 
I'm a cisgendered straight man. And um, to write from that point of view, someone who's totally different than me, um, it's scary because I know for me, it comes from a place of wanting to empathize with a character, wanting to include everyone that I've grown up with, um, every type of, of, of person that I've interacted with. Um, so for me, it comes from a, a place of, of respect, fascination, curiosity. Um, but again, we live in political times. We live in political times. We live in um, an era where identity politics is, is a very serious thing. And who gets to tell whose story is very at the forefront of our mind. So it terrifies me. And as a writer, for some weird sadistic reason, I always go towards what terrifies me, what terrifies me. And I feel like um, I always think about the difference between politics and, and fiction. And in fiction, in politics, it's, you know, you will reach more people if you include more people and you're, you're sensitive um, and you're, you're, you're hyper aware of how you stand in the world um, as opposed to somebody else's experience. Um, but I feel like in, in fiction, the rules are like, wherever your imagination goes, obey it. Obey it. It's going to be the farther it goes, the more room for error, more move, room for error. And, um, and that's just like the chance that I've taken. And as a writer, it's, it's a very tough, it's, it's, it's very tough because you know that once you've chosen a certain topic, um, the more far away from it is from you, it, the, 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 the more difficult it is. Um, and so that, I think one, I try to give, I try to give balance, you know, and I can't wait to, to read how, how you've done it. I want, I want, I, you know, I'm gonna throw that question right back at you, <laughs> right? You know, because I feel like as, as cisgendered straight men, mm -hmm. we have two options. We could, we could be like, okay, well, out of respect for the LGBTQIA community, let's not touch that subject. You know, we, right. could, we could do that. Um, right. But I do think there's a, another form of respect and it's like, let me see what it is to embody somebody else. Um, and right. I, 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 I chose that route. It's scary because in this story, Derry ends up doing or considers doing sex work and mm -hmm. to navigate that it was very tricky very tricky i i mean i mm -hmm. i mean i asked you just because i was like interesting because mm -hmm. i was mm -hmm. like i've been working on a novel a new novel mm -hmm. for a while and mm -hmm. i think just like you're saying right like we can like respectfully leave it alone or mm -hmm. you can but I think at the same time, if you're trying to capture this like that, if you're trying to capture what it feels like to be alive right now, you can't omit that these people were on the block and they were loved and accepted. And, you know, like, it wasn't just like they were, like, outcasts. You know, mm -hmm, like, they were mm -hmm. a part of the ecosystem of the place. And, I mean, I know for myself, like, it came in just because my friend's little brother um, came out as gay. And... It was just a thing that I was like, you know, I have to, you know, illuminate what your story was because oftentimes, you know, there is a lot of humor in those stories, you know, in, in mm -hmm. just in the telling of those stories anyway, mm -hmm. just because, you know, uh, I don't know, humor is another thing to talk about mm -hmm. stories, but um, yeah, thank you. I did one. Yeah, I know. It's, it's interesting. Um, I, there was a, I heard there was a quote from Tom Hanks talking about Philadelphia. And he said, like, you know, um, he, you know, he really enjoyed playing that role, but he doesn't think that he could do it this, you know, it, it wouldn't be accepted um, this time around. 
to, to play a, as a straight man, to play a, a gay character. And that really made me think, and I, I'm not gonna form an opinion or preach and be like, you know, he should or people should or should not. But all I could say about that story um, and about the topic of, you know, portraying gay characters is that if anything, if all else bombs, the conversation, the conversation is cool about it is cool. Um, yeah. So I think one of the things that you do really, really well on the page here mm -hmm. is your characterization. You know, like mm -hmm. I feel like you really develop your characters and I feel like where it shines to me brightest is Miss Dallas because mm -hmm. there's so many characters in that story. You know, like, I mean, you're mm -hmm. in a classroom and I was impressed with how you were able to have so many students in the classroom, but they felt distinct. Like, you know, like I knew mm -hmm. Kimberly was the smart one. I knew Cowboy was the wild. You know, like I knew mm -hmm. you know, like, it, was, it was easy to follow them where I wasn't like, wait, what's that name? What do they do? Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, to me, it just said like, I, if I had to guess, I'm just like, no, you spent like copious amounts of time around you. <laughs> just because of the way you got the uh, details. But I was just wondering if you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, no, I appreciate the the love on that. Um, yeah, that you know, I feel like the classroom is where I feel most comfortable. Um, I'm a I'm a public school teacher, so over the years I've just met tons of characters, tons of personalities, um, and you know, after a certain amount of years teaching, you start seeing like semi repeats. You know, so you start seeing, like you said, Kimberly, you start seeing lots of Kimberly's. Like there's over the years, 10 Kimberly's, um, you know, 10 Cowboys, you know? And so I think just by the experience of teaching, I, I got a little bit good at like giving them one line descriptions. Um, and so I think that helped me in that story where it's like 25, 30 kids in the classroom and I could be like um, so-and-so who likes, um, holding down one um, nostril and blowing <laughs> snot at the other, <laughs> which oddly enough, <laughs> that type wow. of person occurs every two years. <laughs> the loud, it is also the loud laugher, the one who yeah. like disrupts with the loud laughter. And you want to be like, don't laugh. And they'll, and they'll be like, I'm just laughing. I'm just laughing. What, what, are you going to throw me out of the classroom laughing? And I'm like, don't laugh. But you know, just the cast of characters of, you know, who who's who and the, the one line description. That story took a long time. I think um, in the beginning, what I didn't have in that story was the timeline. It was just a miscellaneous. Uh, um, there was no, there was no structure into like, maybe the school is closing down. That didn't happen uh, early in the in draft. Okay. Um, also the, the span of a year, like my writers group had to tell me like, just make it a span of a school year. And so we know when we are in time. Um, so that's that's where that that was. Um, and yeah, I see like a team seven, you you know, you do it in the in the classroom too. You have Andre in the classroom, um, and he gets thrown out, and I'm like, yo, schools be like, and the, the teachers be the, the, the teachers, like it's the same type of teachers, like. Yeah, I, I thought that was, I thought the scene that I really enjoyed was when you had her in the teacher's room and she was listening to kind of like, I don't know, they made me think of kind of like, um, you know, the well-to-do coming to the city to help the urban youth, uh, you know, from the <laughs> Ivy League schools. And, you know, I think the one thing that doesn't get talked about in that transition is kind of like that cultural class collision where yeah. you know you have these upper class people that don't understand the nuances of actually being a part of like the proletariat so to say and mm. so I like the moment that it got me was when because I was thinking about the, my classroom situation and like I was like the wanderer like I was the one I was going to go to the bathroom and I was like <laughs> and uh, I love the moment where the kid has to go to the bathroom and 
Miss Dallas was like, boy, sit you behind that. Yeah. And, like, <laughs> and, and like, to me, I was like, she's 100% right because she knows about him. But then I, I immediately, I knew what was happening when he was like, you, and he was like, uh, you may go to the bathroom. I was like, oh. Hey, yo. I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yo, it's it's so funny, those dynamics that, that happen in the classroom. Um, and I've done it to other people and I have people do it to me. Um, and like, it's just tough because you'll, you'll have like, as much as people don't want to say, in, as much as adults try to make it in the school, like we're all adults and you need to obey all of us. We secretly have our petty, like, oh, you're oh. a teacher, you're an assistant and whatnot. But then, just like you said, the way our class and the pro proletariat, like, people don't understand that, like, class dynamic. Um, a lot of times, you'll have a first or second year teacher who is the teacher, the head teacher, and the power who's there for, like, 10 years. Mm -hmm. And because the teacher's the one giving the, the instructions, then all of a sudden, it's like the power has to defer to the, to the, to the teacher. Um, and so, um, you know, I just wanted to kind of tell that story from the Paris perspective, because I met a lot of Paris, a composite of a lot of Paris, and they always have a humorous take, very true, insightful take on the classroom. And I just wanted to say that. Like, you yeah, know, I feel like I, it just to me, the difference was like that kind of rigid stickler that like is educated to be here. And then that like auntie that's just been around the way for a long time she knows what's up with everybody and i just thought that you know i thought mm. the ending was powerful man mm. um you know we're like you know people that will not learn still need to be taught mm -hmm. that mm. line i was i feel like that was a line man like i feel like right there i was like well just we'll get there um, <laughs> <laughs> i appreciate so, uh, that that means a lot coming from you yeah no nah, man i i was into it man. um <laughs> Can I skip to another story that I really yeah, like? Yeah, Can yeah. I ask you about? Yeah. Um, the Okie Doke. Oh. <laughs> yeah, the Okie Doke, yo. <laughs> like, uh, I feel like, uh, I feel like I done lived that story. <laughs> like, I like, I like, like, I feel like I'm like, man, I know what it's like when you are with a group of people that are about to commit a crime. <laughs> and you're kind of like, man, I don't really want to be a part of this. And, you know, where did that story come from? Because I, I feel like as I read it, I was like, man, I've seen this dynamic play out a million times. Mm, yo, yo, it is, it's, it's funny. Cause like online you will like see somebody's mugshot or you would see a, a prison show and you'd be like, that dude looks scary. But a lot of times people who are committing crimes are just, they just get caught up, you know? They just get yeah. caught up. It, you know, scared. they're stupid. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, it, you know, like in Team Seven, I remember, like in Team Seven, there's like there's like a rival gang that that's that's coming to to, to basketball court, um, and then like it's the 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 main characters in the midst of it, and he's kind of wants to impress the guys on this block, and as one of them is like like trying to escape or running like he throws the basketball and like again crime crime that's a crime you can't like assault away with basketball but you're like this is a good kid who just like helping, helping people out and so that story is like you know it's based on a, a story one of my students told me you know that I had to like doctor up a little bit um he was like I it started off with the prompt how was your weekend, guys? <laughs> <laughs> it started with that prompt. <laughs> I mean, um, and, and, this, and this kid was like, we were trying to, uh, we were ordering uh, Chinese food. We didn't have the money. So we were just going to give them like papers and stuff like that. And we were going to rob, we were going to rob. I was like, hold on. I was like, before you finish the story, I'm obligated to say that you are committing, you, you are, you are confessing to a mandated reporter. Hey. <laughs> listen, I, I like, need a lot I of allegedly. Like, <laughs> I know, allegedly. <laughs> so I was like, go, I was like, go on. <laughs> and he's like, well, one of us, <laughs> one of us, uh, we were all running and we did it. Oh, one of us, and one of us didn't come back. One of us like 
took a long time to come back. And so, you know, that was the basis. And my, I thought about like, what would make somebody not come back in time? And so the okie doke is like, you know, guys who decide to do this Chinese food delivery robbery, but well, one guy doesn't want to do it because he wants to make his life a little better. Um, and he's tired wow. of doing this. Um, and so, you know, as a general rule, I feel like we as writers, um, we have characters sometimes who make the wrong decisions. And, you know, our job is to just kind of make them, give them a fair portrayal, not to make them too evil, not to make them too um, angelic. And so that was just about guys who commit a, a, a robbery and how one has a, a, a crisis of conscience. Let's see what else can I um, Light feet. Yeah. Bro, you broke my whole heart. Like, <laughs> I, I was, bro, I thought, like, I feel like, you know, after they got out of the train station, I was like, fellas, I didn't see it going there. Um, <laughs> like, uh, but I really like that you touch on the light feet thing, just because, I mean, I feel like I was out of the city for a little while and I came home and I was on the arms and you know, I just feel like it just took over and I was like, what? the hell is happening? Mm. Like, you know, like they just, just, mm. just kind of just rolled through dancing. And I was like, oh, this is rubbish. <laughs> you know, and, and so, you know, uh, can you talk a bit about where that story came from? Is that another? Yeah, story? yeah. You know, that one, I think, you know, and there's uh, always that 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 um classic question where, um, and I'm sure you've got it too before, where it's like, you know, um, does, does, does a story start with like a character, a voice, or like a plot or something? So that one was started as like a composite of a character, like a type, again, a typer student. Um, and that typer student that I've had over the years is like the, um, I, I call it the, the entrepreneurial student, like who's like making money somehow after the bells rings, you know, the, the kid who's like, you know, let me, let me paint your, your sneakers. Let me, let me graffiti your, your shirt for $20. And, you know, I've had kids like that and I've had kids, you know, who d dance on the trains and whatnot. Um, and so, um, and so that, that one came from, from that. And there was just, um, you know, one kid who, uh, who, who did that and he used to come to my classroom and show me the videos and whatnot. And oh, like he no. oh, he educated me on it because I'm like, <laughs> yeah. I thought y'all were just dancing on the train. I thought y'all would just randomly just go in and just, but apparently, you know, you dance on the trains, you try to make enough money. So, you know, there's a rented out studio in Times Square and you try to get enough money to go in a dance, the dance studio so you can make like a real dance video. Um, and so that happened. The idea of like, you know, the, the, the climax of that story, the tragic thing that happens. Um, that one, I just, um, I guess in my gloomy, depressed mind, just kind of made that, made that up. Um, and, you know, I was, I was, one, one of the things I, I do is, um, I'm a slush pile reader for the literary mag, um, a public space. And okay. so it's a great education in terms of, you read submissions, you see what people are writing, you see if the, yeah. you, you read stuff that you really love and then you're like, all right, let's see how this goes. You know, let's see where it goes. Right, right. Um, and a lot of times stuff really that you read that is like really, really good, you know, sometimes doesn't make it just because there's not enough space. Um, right. And I remember reading a story that was totally different from Light Feet, but it was a confessional. It was about, um, uh, a, a guy, um, a, a, a homosexual man confessing a crush to his straight friend. And like that, and it was like in the form of like a, like a letter. And like, I was like, oh, wow. wow, that like letter confessional thing where you're like mm -hmm. really sorry for something. 
and you write it out, like it just gr grabbed me. So I wanted to like kind of make that um, story, you know, in a similar, like use the confessional letter thing like that. Um, and did you get pushback on like um, the voice in that story? Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. I've got, I've got, I got pushed back on this whole, I was going to say the S-H-I-T word, but, you know, <laughs> Harvard. <laughs> um, no, nah, I got pushed back on this whole thing, which is really weird, like, because then it's like, it goes from like, you get a lot of constructive criticism, a lot of notes on the voice, and then you get done and people praise it. And it feels good to be praised. You know, I'm not gonna sit up here and tell you, Marcus, that you know, you know, from having published a novel and gotten rave reviews, like you know, like it feels good. It feels good. Right. And but at the same time, like you realize, like you're like, you know, I always think of the Lupe Fiasco line where he's like, I want to believe my own hype, but it's too untrue, you know? And so like. Yep. Thinking about the pushback, I got pushed back on that where it was like the miss the kid writing and misspelling it's too wrong and it's like not realistic and um you know th this uh a earlier draft was like um he seems to be just watching his friends doing stuff and not participating and he's not independent enough um you know, um, I've gotten this too stereotypical. I've gotten, um, you know, voice too reliant on voice. Um, but I've tried I try over, over the years to just, you is know. Is this now mm -hmm. just like feedback from like when you were a student or like, you know, cause I know it's funny cause I thought mm -hmm. about this cause mm -hmm. I know for mm -hmm. team seven, I was at Susquehanna in Central Pennsylvania around a lot of like kids that were from rural PA and farm mm. and stuff. And I mean, they just like couldn't accept it. They were just like, people don't live like this. Like, what are you talking about? Like, you know, they were just like, you're crazy. And so I was kind of like, I wonder how much they hated on him for doing this. <laughs> <laughs> because I just feel like because the collection is so unapologetically black. And I know that sometimes going through those spaces, you know, sometimes our stories can have a rough go at it. Um, mm. And and that's why I was thinking about that story specifically, because I was like, oh man, like it it looks uneducated, but it is intentional. Like, you know, like I was just mm, like, Yeah, yeah, It's yeah. like very smart, but <laughs> um, it, yeah, I was just like, I wonder how much trouble to gave you about that. Yeah, and um, you know what? It's like, it's, it's um, you know, like a lot of times, um, I guess like in music, like singers, like somebody like, uh, you know, people talk about like, all right, so there's like the, the R&B singer, soul singer. And a lot of times in an interview, they'll like stop and they'll remind people, they're like, oh, but I'm classically trained. There's some notion <laughs> of like the classically, I'm classically trained. Like, like I, I sung in a church or even some people are like, you know, I went to Juilliard or I like, you know, had a voice train. I'm classically trained. And I think about how that is for like writers. Um, and like, we, we're writing about the hood, you know? Like, as soon as I read Team Seven, I was like, I was like, this dude from, from Black Milton, this dude, is, you know? I was like, I know, I know exactly where this dude is from. And uh, I'm like, and, um, and like, so we're writing about the city, right about the hood. But you went to Iowa, you know, you're classically trained, right? <laughs> like, you know, I'm writing a story, but like there's um, Flowers for Algernon, which is like a classic, you know, story about a, a person who's like not intelligent, who's like, um, he you know, um, becomes, he writes a, a, a diary and like it's misspelled in the beginning and stuff like that. So that idea of like, portraying somebody who's not that smart on the on the writing and like misspelling that like that's not even a Sadiq Fofana thing you know like that's like you can go back to to uh 
you know, push uh, Sapphire. You could go back to um, I was thinking Sapphire. Yeah, you could go back to Flowers for Algonon. Like that is not an original thing. I'm classically trained. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I will so, say no. though, one yeah. story like Miss Dallas in a very mm. strange way reminded mm. me. Have you read James on the Pierce and Solo Shark for Doc? Solo Song for Doc. Wow, you know what? I read it after um like towards the end of that co collection, um working on this collection. But yeah, I read that story. I read that story. And it's funny. I read that story when I was working on um the 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 last story, which is about the old man um okay. chess. Yeah. And okay. I was writing, I had written that story for years, and then like just as leisure reading, I I picked up that that story and I was like, oh my God, my God. <laughs> I should not even do this. Cause you know, it's about a, you know, an older man. He's yeah, like yeah, working on the sure. trains. He's been a waiter and he's giving mm -hmm. advice to young and he's like, sit down young blood. And like, yeah. and I remember I even used, I, I think, I think because of that story, I took out all the, the young bloods in my yeah. like, <laughs> uh, references to young. I was like, I'm not gonna use that word. Cause then people are gonna be like, Oh, there's this um a real story <laughs> that, that uses that. <laughs> well, it's so funny because I can see the story in both places. Because yeah. when I thought about Doc, mm -hmm. I thought about Miss Dallas, and I thought about almost like the teacher is like the train checker, and like you know, like that's like kind of trying to get in, and like mm -hmm. I kind of felt like you know, like Miss Dallas and like you know the person she was paired with, you know. They were ill paired. <laughs> and um, mm. I kind of just thought about that where, you know, her heart was for the kids. And so to me, it just seemed like almost like a neighborhood business or like hood justice where like, you know, she was kind of like, you know, well, you earned it. So uh, yeah, you know, it, looked like, <laughs> it looked like, you know, you earned yourself something to happen and like, you know, who am I to stop it? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, yeah the, the, the passive, you know, and I didn't even know that like the term that, people identified and workshop for that, which I was like, oh, thanks for that term. It's like the passive betrayal, you know? It's like, <laughs> oh, I'm just let, man, you know, I'm gonna just let that happen. <laughs> um, and so, you know, Miss Dallas does that passive betrayal. Like, I'm gonna just let this kid do with this. Yeah, no, I mean, I thought like mm -hmm. the ending, like, I mean, I think you nailed that ending, man. Oh. <laughs> uh, I appreciate that. I mean, it means a lot, I appreciate it. So now, Tumble, where oh, yeah. did that, where did that come from? Because, you know, it's so funny. I, uh, my older sister did Jamaica, mm. which is mm -hmm. not a very um, Black girl-centric mm -hmm. situation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was just kind of like, you know, where did this gymnast from the hood come from? <laughs> Tell me. Yo, I'm glad you asked me that. I'm glad you asked me that. So, um, so I wrote that story around... 2010 um oh, wow. and um and it was like it's, it's so, it was such a struggle to write such a struggle to write because i came in with a thesis anytime i come into a story with a thesis it like it goes wrong so i wanted to base that story on gabby douglas so like gabby douglas was the inspiration for that story because she had just you know, she was the first black girl to win all, all around. Um, and, um, you know, I was like, wow, that's really cool. Um, so she was an inspiration for that story. And then also I randomly watched um, a uh, documentary on PBS. It's a, I, I think it's like, it's just super good. It's called Peace Star Rising. And it's about like a girl and her father, the girl's like a, child rapper and she goes with her father like everywhere and they perform and that whole idea of like child prodigy in the hood combined with like the gabby douglas thing was like okay i want to write about a girl from the hood who's a gymnast and my thesis was that okay gabby douglas won gold all around but what happens to the thousands of you know um, people from the hood who don't do it who are like mm -hmm. like they're like gabby douglas 
is 99.9%. Like, mm-hmm. that's where she's at. Mm-hmm. If you're 99%, you're not making a dime off of gymnastics. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, what happens to that person if who, who's going in the hood? And I was, and that was the thesis. Of course, it didn't go well. And then all of a sudden, like, I made up this character called Nisha B. Miles. And then, like, a couple years later, there's, like, a girl named Simone Biles. <laughs> I'm like, yo, no, no. No. So, no. So, were you, so, were you drafting a lot of these stories, like, over the years? Or like, you know, because a lot of times I feel like people would often say to me, like, you know, I thought, like, you just, like, wrote the book, like, straight up. And I was like, oh, God, no. Like, you know, I mean, that's yeah, you yeah. write it all kinds of out of order. You know, like, how did you... uh you know, where did you kind of start? Because oftentimes people think I started in the beginning and I'm like, the first chapter I wrote for the book is actually like, the, I think it's like the eighth chapter now. <laughs> really? First, yeah, like the first thing I wrote for it was called um, The Big One Too. Um, that was the first wow. short story. That that was like the first short story that I ever written. And I wrote it for my intro to fiction class and I was on a basketball team and I was all stressed out. My classmates were all pretentious. So I just like skipped class like I don't do it. And so I saw a kid in the training room and I was like, bruh, what was the homework? And he was like, write a first person narrative. I was like, bet. And so I wrote, like, so I wrote it and came to class. <laughs> Yo, that's what, what, which one was, um, so when he, when he goes and he, uh, he meets his half brother. Yeah. Was that an early, uh, was that an early one or a late one? That was the very first one that I wrote. That's the oh wow, one. wow. That was wow. the first one that I wrote, and I mean, I don't know. It doesn't happen often, but I mean, it was like the first one I wrote, and I kind of just left it like that. Like, um, yeah, uh, it was just a deep story that, like, you know, just came from a real place. <laughs> Yo, that was like this dude is because you know he's the cool one, the basketball player, and then like his half brother is like itching to be his friend. And he's just like, nah, bro, nah. you're not even cool enough for me. <laughs> nah, 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 really. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah, but the, um, yeah. Go ahead, sorry, I don't want to cut you. Go ahead, sorry. Oh, no, no, I was just going to say the, the first story I, I wrote was um, The Young Entrepreneurs, which ended up being like the fourth story in there. Or, yeah, um, I think the fourth story. Um, so wait, was that with Candace in North Carolina? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so... So you so you like reversed that? Like you wrote that in the Miss Dallas, but it wasn't the other way around? Yeah, yeah. And the age, it's funny, like it's like asking, you know, like I every time I I wanna like answer a question about a craft thing, I wanna I, my instinct is to be like, I came up with the idea, or either next best thing, like one of my writer buddies. But it always feels like a little bit weird when I'm like, not nah, the agent came up with that idea. <laughs> yeah. So that so you know, my agent picked me up basically on that on the young entrepreneurs story. And like he read the Okie Doke. Um, and he said, like, he's the one who came up with the idea of like, maybe you should link link the, this and have the kid the characters oh. like, you know. And um, right, right. and I was like, all right, all right. And then he was also the idea. He was like, yeah. And he's like, you know how Candice like comes to the summer vacation because she like did what she did to the teacher. Like, have a story where you explain how that happened. And so that's uh, what Miss Dallas, yeah, Miss Dallas was like telling the story of what Candice did. You know. Um, wow. So, the story yeah. is so much more. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah the, the story is so much more. It's so funny to hear yeah. how they like how they come together, though. Um, yeah. So there is a question here. It says, mm-hmm. if this character story was the most challenging or scary to write, is there a character or story that felt easy and seamless to, to write? Do you prefer writing the more challenging characters? Um. Great, yeah, that's a great question. Shout out to, yeah, shout out to that question. Um, Yeah, the easiest one was um, the okie doke, you know, cause like, you know, you grew up in Black Milton. I grew up in Roxbury. 
<laughs> and you go to New York, it's the same thing. Dudes, yeah. you know, dudes on the corner, like, you know, you know pontificate on life, getting into stuff. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you just like, that's just, you familiar with that. So that one is, and I, I love that voice. And when I read Team 7, I was like, oh, I, I, I finished the book in, I want to say three, four days. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, you, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was like, yep, yep. I understand this world. And he, he did it exactly how I remember it. Um, and um, so that was the easiest one. And, you know, somewhere down the line, I would definitely uh, try it again. You know, there's, in that story, there's, there's um, Swan who's telling the story, there's Boones and there's Miller. And, you know, I might tell Miller's story somewhere down the line, um, but, yeah. you know, um, so that was, that was the easiest, um, the easiest one. Um, the hardest, the, the challenging one was, um, um, I guess the, the the old man at the end who's playing chess was was very challenging because I had to rely on something other than like really, really um, dense vernacular because I wanted, didn't want him to portray him. All. I wanted to portray his voice more in like the like colorful, proverbial Whoa. things he says rather than so that was tough tumble was also um very tough because it's like now i'm not i don't have this gimmick of like oh here's the spoken ver- um voice that you you know now she's this regular mid-atlantic like right. now i gotta like tell a story and just like you know that was very um very tough but again i, I have a tiny rebel in my heart and it kind of goes <laughs> to whatever is like the most challenging. Sometimes I like think of it as like this tiny, it's a tiny Sadiq in my heart. It was like, go for it, go for it. Who, who can you hate that? <laughs> or sometimes I imagine good. myself like the highest, like whatever cliff it is and there's one foot on the cliff and then there's one foot that's like dangling that's about to like fall off the cliff. And like, I'm like, all right, I'll, I'll yeah, that's where I want to be. <laughs> I thought that's where the good stuff happened. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <that's> it. <laughs> you know. So are you, was this like a singular creative push or like, are you still with these people? Um, there's, um, I think a little bit of, a little bit of both. Um, it, it was, I think I, I, the first thing I came up with was the, was the title. And I just felt it's, took me years to be like, okay, well, if it's gonna be stories from the tenants downstairs, then there's gotta be tenants in the building. There's gotta be somehow like connected to each other. Right. Um, so it did start with that like one thing, one vision. Um, and I am still with the characters only because there were tons of stories that just didn't make it. I, I mean, when you're talking about mm-hmm. it's humble, there was a story introduced at the end where the girl that she had fought when she came home from jail and she was like outside and like she saw her with her kids and like they knew they were about to take her kids. I was kind of like, what is her story? Like, yeah. I, like, okay, like, I was kind of like, bro, like I was, because it, I mean, I think like the elevator ride, like I was like, bro, like I, I, I would like to follow her. <laughs> wow, okay, see? This is where the stuff happens. Like, again, again. So if I write this now, I'm going to be like, yeah, um, Marcus Burks uh, suggested this. Because somebody I'll suggested Light Feet. <laughs> I was going to say, somebody was... thank me later. Sadiq, you got to do it, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, someone was like, someone, when I was workshopping, they was like, you, t- you know, this is a lot of New York stories. Why don't you tell a story about um, those kids on the train? And I was like, I bet. All right, I'll try. I'll try. <laughs> so those yeah. bad, yo, those suggestions uh, that definitely work. So yeah, man. I mean, how? how so I we were talking in the green room, and I was saying that uh, <laughs> I read your piece in Lit Hub, and uh, how are you? Uh, you know, how is this moment treating you? Because I know I was, I felt like so kindred to what you were saying. I was like, I was mm. stressed out. I was stressed. Mm. Out. <laughs> And I mean, you're getting reviewed really well. You know, Mm -hmm. I was just gonna say, is it just a lot to take in? 
Yo, yeah, it's just, and that again, like it was one of those things where I was like, okay, why am I torturing myself by putting my feelings out there like that? And then again, the tiny rebel was like, just tell them how you feel, son. Tell them how you feel. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, like, it's like, you know, this, the Sadiq Fofana answer about, you know, publishing a book is like, oh, it's exciting. And I, anybody who's aspiring to write, I wish, I wish this feeling would happen. It's total joy. And that, that's the Sadiq Fofana answer. Um, the Sadiq answer is like, it's stressful. It's stressful because, you know, uh, immediately, like, and it even, it hurts even to even say, like, immediately when you're like publishing a book you're happy for yourself and but then you're then you get this notion of like oh my god my title is going to be in some bookstore next to like Marcus Burke and 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 um, Colson Whitehead and <laughs> Jasmine Ward and somebody's going to come in the bookstore and be like I want Marcus Burke's book. Oh, I, want, I want Jasmine. Like you get that feeling. You're like, oh God. Like there's that. And so any. T so then you you're immediately like, all right, that's a that's a weird feeling. Um, and then you get the the interviews. Um, and you know you know Erica Badu is like keep in keep in mind I'm sensitive about my ish. You know, and yeah. and so you like you get a question. And the question could be totally innocent and it could be totally like the interviewer's curiosity, but like you're playing mind games in your head where you're like, mm -hmm. is this a veiled critique? <laughs> <laughs> Are they asking me to defend myself right now? You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> and so th there's, there's that and you just kind of feel a little bit like, you know, alienated sometimes um, and, it, I think what you said when we were in a green room where we were like, um, watch the book, don't watch me, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> you know, and that's like, that's like the feeling where it's like, I, a lot of times I'm just like, you know, I just kind of just want to throw it, throw it out there. And you, you know, you, you interpret that, but, but then you have to like the interviews. And again, this has been like, when I'm in it, like this conversation has been great and just just, you know, interacting with you, you know, someone's yeah, work, whose work I loved has been, it's been cool, um, really, really cool. And, um, but, you know, sometimes beforehand it gets dreadful because you're like, oh man, I got to speak on, I might just say something that people just don't like. Um, so it's mixed, it's a lot of mixed feelings. Um, so, you know. Oh, I totally dig it. I mean, I know when I was on book tour, like mm -hmm. I thought about everything, but I remember at my first, it was actually at the Harvard Coop. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and wow. I had just given my reading, and I swear, I looked out at the crowd and I was like, oh, man, y'all can say anything in here, huh? <laughs> <laughs> like, I was just kind of like, oh, boy. Like, and I got to like fix my face. Like, I was just like, oh, man. And like, and then I'd be leaving it to my best friend. My best friend asked me the craziest question. And I was just kind of like, oh, bro. <laughs> like, yeah, like it was, uh, you know, just one of those great moments. <laughs> yeah, you know, so, uh, yeah, I totally dig it. But, you know, I did just want to say, like, super huge congratulations, man. Like, this is oh, a man. really, uh, you know, like, I feel like this is definitely, y'all go pick this up. Um, wow. You know, I wow. feel like this going to make some noise. And I mean, ultimately, I mean, I'm done with it. But, like, you know, I'm still worrying about, like, that one girl that got off the elevator. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, like these characters linger in my mind. You know, like I was kind of like, "What does Swan want to do?" Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because I was kind of yeah. like, you know, like you know, what does he want to do with himself? No, he's not <laughs> anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, that's the best compliment, man. Yo, that's that that kind of stuff just keeps me going. That kind of stuff keeps me going. So I really, yeah, yeah. You really gotta keep do giving to the game. That. Yeah, you gotta keep yo. giving to the game, man. For sure. Yo, it hurt. Means a lot. Means a lot. Yeah. Um, cool. Claire's back. What yeah. an amazing conversation. Mm -hmm. I felt like I was just I know you guys didn't really know each other before this, but I felt mm -hmm. like I was listening to two friends just hashing it out. It was fantastic. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much, Sadiq and Marcus. 
Um, and thank you to everyone out there in Zoom land um, for spending your evening with us. Uh, you can learn more about and purchase the book at harvard.com or via the link in the chat. Uh, on behalf of Harvard Bookstore in Cambridge, Massachusetts, have a great night. Keep reading and please be well, everyone. And thank you again for tonight. Okay. I'll shoot you an email, bro. All right. Cool. Cool. Yeah, for sure. Cool. It's been a pleasure.